You're heading south of the Mason-Dixon. This is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is your host, Brian McClanahan, and this is episode 110, covering the week of February 26th through March 2nd, 2018. Glad to have you back in the program. Glad to be here. Before we get started, just want to remind you of all the usual things. Please follow us on Twitter at Abbeville Institute. On Facebook, you can like us there at Abbeville Institute. And you can subscribe to our YouTube page at Abbeville INST. If you do like this podcast and everything we do, please consider a tax-deductible donation to the Abbeville Institute. You can do that by going to abbevilleinstitute.org. At the top of the page, you'll see a menu that says Support. Click on that, drop down, it'll show you memberships for individuals. You can click on that, and it'll take you to all of our different membership options. You can donate monthly or annually. Monthly for as little as $3 a month if you're a student, or $5 a month if you're not a student, or annually for as little as $25 a year if you're a student, or $50 if you're not a student. So go on out and check all that out. And while you're at our website, abbevilleinstitute.org, you can give us an email address. We'll give you Kirkpatrick Sales Emancipation Hell for free, and you will get our daily dose of Dixie Monday through Friday, along with our weekly email on Saturday or Sunday. And also a few new things. If you want to support your Abbeville Institute gear, go on out to abbevilleinstitute.org. and the button that says Support, there should be a Shop uh, tab. You click on that, and that will take you out to all the cool items we've got for sale now, polos, fleece jackets, uh, hats. So you can go out and get your Abbeville Institute uh, apparel. And we've got an Abbeville Institute app. So go to your app store, whether it's uh, iTunes, Google Play, whatever else, whatever uh, device you use, go out to your app store, put in Abbeville Institute. You can download our app where you can listen to this podcast along with all of our lectures from our summer schools and scholars conferences. There's over 200 of those, over 300 items, media items on the app. Plus, it does take you to our uh, website material Monday through Friday if you click on the articles tab in the app. It'll take you out, and you can go to the website that way. So great stuff happening out there. We've got the app. We've got the website. Now we've got apparel. We have a lot of great things going on at the Institute, and all that is possible, of course, with your donation to the Institute. We exist on your generous contributions alone. So if you do like what we do and you like our programs and everything we do, please consider a donation. Uh, it's uh, greatly appreciated. And, of course, uh, your donations go to things like our uh, conference this past weekend, which in my opinion, is one of the best conferences we've ever had at the Abbeville Institute. So I'm going to take a little time and talk about that uh, for a few minutes and also the material we have for the week. But uh, let me just start with that conference. Uh, now, we've done quite a few conferences. The Abbeville Institute has been around since 2002. We've done a summer, actually, uh, from 2002, yes. We've done a summer school every year since 2002. We've had various scholars' conferences. Within the last uh, several years, the last three or four years, we've started doing conferences that are uh, more public uh, involved, where we've opened them up to the public. Uh, before, we had scholars' conferences where we had uh, our graduate students and uh, various academics go and present papers. But we've done some different types of conferences. And these we did a really good one in 2010 in Charleston, where we had people like Tom DiLorenzo and uh, Thomas Naylor, who's now dead, and and um, uh, various other, Larry Reed from... from uh, uh, FEE. So we had some really uh, great people out of that, but we've started doing these these public conferences. And this one, uh, which was on Confederate monuments, was just superb. First of all, we sold out. We had no seats left, so we had uh, we had a great turnout. Uh, a lot of a lot of enthusiastic people from all over the country. We had people there from California and Utah. It was just a tremendous time. In fact, uh, the uh, the individual, one of the individuals from California was a Korean individual, and he said he really loves the Southern tradition because it speaks to him uh, in terms of traditional culture and religion. Uh, and so I mean, just a, a great time and, and some, some really fascinating people there. <clears throat> and, of course, the topic is timely. We're talking about monuments. The, the, the attack on the monuments has died down somewhat. We did see in December uh, monuments removed. Uh, but... Um, this this it's died down, but it's not going away. You know, we saw that the the, the shrouds came off the monuments there in Virginia this is past week. But I'm sure that the the uh, city of Charlottesville is going to try to put them back up, um, and there's no question that's going to happen. But um, or at least they're going to try. Uh, and I think this is being blocked by law at this point. But we'll we'll see where all this all this how all this pans out. But certainly this is a a timely topic. 
and again, the quality of the speakers. We had uh, every every talk was tremendous. And of course, we, we recorded all these. So if you did not have the chance to go to the conference, you will get these uh, in recorded form, either through the app or the website or YouTube. We'll put them all up there. They're on video and audio. And the highlight, of course, was Ben Jones' talk, Congressman Ben Jones, better known as Cooter. He did our banquet speech, and it was one of the best talks I've ever heard about Confederate monuments. He did a lot of other things, too. talked about, you know, Southern history and his role in the Dukes of Hazard, and and uh, just this idea of, you know, the South in the 70s. He talked about the Civil Rights Movement. He was highly involved in that and his perspective on that. Um, but it was just a, a tremendous time, a lot of fellowship. And if you've never been to an Abbeville conference before, um, this one was the best. And I can just see us expanding on these. We did one, we did a couple in 2016. Uh, we did one in Charleston in 2016 and one in Atlanta in 2016. And both were well attended, but not like this. The one in Atlanta was sold out as well. We, we had filled that one, but um, we didn't have as large of a room. So we had about 80 people for the Atlanta conference. Uh, and, um, again, sold out. I'm gonna, I am gonna. think we're going to see these things get larger and larger and more and more people. And there are grand time. Uh, people like the idea of meeting like-minded people and, and talking about the South and the Southern tradition and, and being around people that you don't have to worry about, are these people going to attack me for being pro-Southern? Uh, it's, a, it's a great time. Plus, we have you know, there's a, uh, people selling books from Shotwell Press. We've got our own merchandise we sell there. So it's just a, a wonderful time to, to meet and engage uh, with, uh, with like-minded people. Um, the, the talk that... Um, uh, Aaron Wolf gave uh, was just tremendous. Aaron Wolf from Chronicles Magazine. If you if you're not a subscriber to Chronicles Magazine, you should think about it. Chronicles, uh, a magazine of American culture, and he's an editor there, and uh, writes great stuff. You can follow him on Twitter. He does have a Twitter account, and so go out and look for Aaron Wolf. Um, I can't remember what his Twitter handle is, but he he puts stuff up. He's very witty. Uh, we had, of course, Doctor Livingston speak. Um, just a uh, a, a usual great talk, uh, Dr. Uh, Kogan, who was a, um, a Jewish Confederate, talked about uh, his perspective on monuments and uh, the flag, and just a really moving speech by Dr. Kogan. Uh, Kirkpatrick Sale gave a great talk about slavery and its uh, wider perspective of this issue of slavery in the uh, in the world. Uh, so we just had some really good talks, and I, I, can't, I can't emphasize that enough. People came away from that conference saying this was one of the best things they've ever been to, and we had a lot of new people there who had never been to an Abbeville event before. So uh, I was pleased with that, and I think Dr. Livingston was pleased with that, and people that are on the board and, and people that have been to these conferences before. We, of course, have people that go that frequent the conferences, but they were all pleased with the quality and of the program and the content and so please consider going to one of these in the future. We're going to have one in Dallas in the fall. We were going to do that in the spring. We moved it to the fall because we, we just ran out of time to do some things. We're going to have one in Dallas in the spring. So uh, probably somewhere in either September or October, we're going to do a Dallas conference. I would think probably closer to October. And, of course, we do have our summer school coming up, which will be in July, July 15th through 20th. Going to be a grand time for that, too. Uh, now, that's that's limited seating. If you are a graduate student, undergraduate student, advanced high school student, or you're a parent of any of these people and you want to send them to that, contact Dr. Livingston as soon as possible and ask about scholarships. We do have scholarships available for these conferences, and these are student-centered, though we do have a lot of people who aren't students go as well, but student-centered. Uh, this year, we are going to have, it's the, the topic is music in the Southern tradition, and we are going to have Bobby Horton do a concert on our banquet night. So it's going to be a 90-minute show. If you've never heard Bobby Horton before, he does period music. It's just fantastic. So he's going to be there uh, doing a lecture or concert. So it's going to be a grand time again. You need to get to one of our conferences. Uh, they're, they're well worth the time and effort and the money that you would spend on them. We, we really try to make sure we put on a good program. So all that said, um, it was you know, that's kind of an advertisement, but uh, we don't have anything, another conference planned until October, and I'll talk more about it when we get there. But let's talk about the week that was at the Abbeville Institute, because that's really what you're here for, for me to talk about the, the material. And so we had several good articles this week, I think. Um, some different things. Uh, we did have an article, started off Monday with an article on Spencer Rowan. Now, if you don't know who Spencer Rowan is, you're, you're missing out. And most people don't know who Spencer Rowan is because 
uh, he never served on the United States Supreme Court. Now, that doesn't mean he wouldn't have served on the Supreme Court. In fact, Jefferson probably was going to appoint him chief justice if John Adams had not snuck in John Marshall just before he left office. Of course, John Marshall was uh, Secretary of State, and Adams was trying to put his stamp on the federal judiciary. And so he put Marshall on the bench, and that blocked Jefferson's appointment of Roan. Now, if Roan had been appointed, this would have changed forever the Supreme Court because Spencer Roan was part of what was called the Richmond Junto. And the Richmond Junto were the old Republicans. These were people that were dedicated to the principles of federalism and state power. And so when you look at Roan, on the, he, he did serve on the what's, the, what's called the, the uh, Virginia Court of Appeals, which is like the Supreme Court for the state of Virginia. And he was constantly sniping at federal power, at the Federalists, at John Marshall, uh, and the decisions that court was making. And so here you have in Spencer Roan, this piece was written by Joe Wolverton, who's a, a great scholar for us, does a fantastic job in what he writes. Uh, but here, here you have an individual who's overlooked in American history because he didn't have the stature in the general government. But yet when you, you're on our side and you start talking about limited federal power, limited general power, central power, federal will be a misnomer. Uh, you have to go back and look at Spencer Rowan. In fact, in my book, How Alexander Hamilton Screwed Up America, I talked a lot about Spencer Rowan because the second half of the book is dedicated to Marshall and Story and Hugo Black. But Marshall and Story, of course, contemporaries of Rowan, so uh, he had a lot to say about them. But Rowan and the Richmond Junto, in many cases, were more Jeffersonian than Jefferson himself. And the things that they wrote about the general government, just fantastic. Uh, and some of, the, some of the attacks they made, some of the things they said um, about the powers of the central government and, and the limited nature of the uh, central government are just so important to read. Um, and in 19, uh, 1819, excuse me, uh, he wrote a letter to the editor. This is his first letter to the editor, June 11th, 1819, and, and Wolverton brings this up. Uh, and he talks about um, federal power and the, the federal judiciary. And he says, quote, The warfare waged by the judicial body has been of a bolder tone and character. It was not enough for them to sanction in former times the detestable doctrines of Pickering and Company, as foresaid. It was not enough for them to annihilate the freedom of the press, by incarcerating all those who dare with a manly freedom to canvass the conduct of their public agents. It was not enough for the predecessors of the present judges to preach political sermons from the bench of justice and bolster up the most unconstitutional measures of the most abandoned of our rulers. It did not suffice to do the business in detail and ratify, one by one, the legislative infractions of the constitutions. That process would have been too slow and perhaps too troublesome. It was possible also that some Hampton might make a stand against some ship money measure of the government. And although he would lose his cause with the court, might ultimately gain it with the public. And of course, he's talking about some letters to the. Uh, uh, well, there was the. Um, the Hampton essays were written against the federal judiciary. They resolved, therefore, to put down all discussions of the kind in future by judicial coup de main, to give a general letter of attorney to the future legislatures of the Union, and to tread underfoot all those parts and articles of the Constitution which had been heretofore deemed to set limits to the power of the federal legislature. That man must be a deplorable idiot who does not see that there is no earthly difference between an unlimited grant of power and a grant limited in its terms, but accompanied with unlimited means of carrying it into execution." And so, again, Roan was so perceptive and precise in his attacks on the federal judiciary. Uh, he says in these Hampton letters, of course, these were written by him. He says, the rights of the states ought not to be usurped and taken from them, for the powers delegated to the general government are few and deferred and relate to external objects, while the states retain a residuary and invaluable sovereignty over all other subjects. Over all those great subjects which immediately concern the prosperity of the people, are these last powers of so trivial a character that it is entirely unimportant which of the governments act upon them? 
So he's outlining here what's often considered to be the compact, quote, theory of the Constitution, but he's pointing out what the ratifiers have said about the document. The powers of the states were unlimited. The powers of the general, general government were limited. And so you need to read about Spencer Rowan. If you haven't taken the time to read this essay, or if you want to read uh, my Hamilton book, I talk a lot about Rowan, you need to go out and do it. But he's, and, if, and if you're looking for, I've talked to graduate students several times, you're looking for someone to write about, write about Spencer Rowan. If you want to focus on this period, I mean, you, you're writing about John Randolph or others, write about Spencer Rowan. Go out and look at these things and do it. Because Rowan is this un, uh, unknown character in, uh, in the uh, early Federal Republic. Um, there was Philip Pendleton Barber, which uh, just had a, a nice treatment by uh, a guy named Belko. Uh, so he was another one of these individuals. But Rowan is still virtually unknown. And so um, you need to go out and read Spencer Rowan. Now, on Tuesday, we ran a piece. Um, it was a book review of Gene Kaiser's Slavery Was Not the Cause of the War Between the States. And Gene Kaiser came out to our conference, very nice guy from Charleston, uh, writes really good history. He's, an, he's what you would call, quote, an amateur historian, but well-educated. And uh, this little book, Slavery Was Not the Cause of the War Between the States, came out in 2014, and he takes apart piece by piece this argument that it was slavery that led to the war. Um, and what he does, and essentially you know, there, there are many historians who have taken this perspective in a different way. I mean, look, slavery was an issue, as we've talked about, but it was an issue among many issues, and it was an important issue. But why was it important is the key, is the key question. And it was important because of power. Because of power. Slavery was an issue to drive a wedge between the West and the South. And if you go back and look at early American history, you look at the Louisiana Purchase, you look at Western expansion, Northeastern interests were highly critical of expanding because they thought that all of these farmers in the West and the South would unite together and obstruct the Hamiltonian economic system, which was tariffs, internal improvements, central banking. And so if they could somehow drive a wedge between the West and the South, and two, they did it in two ways. One, they brought up the slavery issue because the West was generally hostile to the institution of slavery. Many times, and there's also this perception that if you're anti-slavery, you're, you're pro-equality or pro, pro-racial equality or pro-black, which really is the exact opposite. Usually the people that were anti-slavery in the West were, were uh, virulent racists. Uh, they just didn't want blacks in their states at all. Didn't want any competition, didn't want them living around. So there, there's this perceptive, uh, the perception of these things is skewed. But um, when you look at that issue and then the other was was internal improvements and eventually the the north of course western farmers wanted them they wanted canals they wanted railroads they wanted road projects and the south had generally been obstructive in those things and this is why john c calhoun eventually at one point said look if we want to get the west on our side we need to start advocating federally funded internal improvements even though they're unconstitutional we need to somehow figure out how to do this or we're going to lose the west and that's ultimately what happened so you have this very interesting position Very interesting perspective going on here, but it was just an issue. And, of course, power. It's always political power, and it was power because of political economy. And so Kaiser um, writes a very good book talking about power. He talks about he defends secession, defends the idea of secession. Um, He attacks Lincoln for being uh, the aggressor in this particular war not the South. And so he does bring in the economic motivation behind the, behind the, behind the war, and of course Lincoln's desire to go to war because the tariff would have steered commerce away from, the low-tariff South would have steered commerce away from the North, which would have hurt, would have hurt uh, Northern finances. So a lot in this particular essay and a lot in that little book, and you should go out and, and pick it up and read it. It's highly worth your time. On Wednesday, we kind of changed pace a little bit, and this is an article by Christopher Carter entitled, Who's Going to Fill Their Shoes? And this is a more of a cultural uh, look at the South. And he, he, he brings up, he says, quote, The trend of the past century has been one of ready and rapid urbanization and suburbanization, 
and emptying of the rural populations. Declining birth rates and regional migration contribute to this. Dependence on manufacturing which fills an area with success and just as easily deflates the newfound affluency with departure causes small mill towns to court more business or lose their citizens who have been deprived of work. The economics of raising many children in such an environment, while not impossible, is seen by many as too much of a hardship, and the people seek out where monetary success and a good dollar living may be had. He says, The old man in the filling station is one we are left pondering, for it is he who is rapidly disappearing from the landscape of the South. Communities are crippled where there is no consistency, with the exception being of the consistency of a steady decline. Where will the families be that tend the farms or work the old country filling stations? Who will provide the populations that will carry on the small-town traditions across the South? These are difficult questions to answer with no salient solution. He says, my own hometown is losing its population at a steady pace. My father, rather than uproot the family and move us to some city, chose to commute instead. Thankfully, his work allowed this for years, and at last he was able to secure work at home. These were difficult situations in which he bore the burden of extra travel on his own person in attempts to profit his family. I believe he succeeded in gifting us with something wonderful and implacable, a true, I'm sorry, irreplaceable, a true home. One is left wondering whom will he will imitate, Jones, who sought ease away from burden with the broad on his back, or a father who goes for so that his family may stay behind. And this is an interesting dilemma in, in my own podcast uh, I brought up this you know, this idea, and uh, I talked a little bit about it. This declining rural uh, environment, and how do you how do you stop that? I think the internet provides some of the answers. You can work from home, but also small farms. You know, we, we really need to think about people going out and working a farm. Uh, and you can at least provide for yourself. This is that independence that we've often talked about on this podcast and at the website. Uh, we've had a number of articles on that, trying to be more self-sufficient and independent. Uh, but this is a real issue. Next week we're going to run a, a little piece on uh, a small town in Mississippi. And uh, same type of idea. But one thing you could think about with these issues, of course, is uh, how uh, communities can be built Based on like-minded people, this is uh, you know there was a, a discussion years ago in South Carolina for like-minded people to move to certain parts of the state and just kind of set up an independent community. And this is this is kind of utopian idea. You just move into an area and then you try to build up the economy there and you and you and you help each other out. In some ways, that's true. In other ways, I mean, there's nothing. There's something natural about that. And, and having small towns and like-minded people, and you have a much more peaceful, prosperous area. So maybe something like that could happen, uh, where you get like-minded people. There was the idea of the Free State Project, where everyone moved to New Hampshire, libertarians moved to New Hampshire, and um, but maybe we need something for that. And you know, certain parts of the South, you could have Southerners move into an area, and you set up shop there, and uh, you create a vibrant economy of like-minded people. Uh, it would have to be a, a program that do something that you you, you try to purchase the land or purchase I mean there there are whole towns for sale at times but you know you have you have shops and other things for people to go and you shop locally and uh, you buy locally and you have produce and uh, you do these type of things because uh, that would help uh, you know create a community maybe that's something that uh, that should be considered by people in the south but we have to ask those questions who's going to fill the shoes in, the, in small towns uh, maybe it's time for a kind of a, a migratory pattern of southerners to go live in the same small town People of like-minded Southerners. Uh, on uh, Thursday, we ran a piece which corresponds to the piece on Tuesday, the pseudoscience attack on the South by Gail Jarvis. And he talks about how many of the people who are now attacking the South aren't really historians. They're sociologists. Um, and this is the problem. And it it's, goes into the monuments. This was actually brought up by uh, Dr. Kogan when he was doing his talk. You know, he said... How do these people know what people were actually thinking when they erected the monuments? There's no clear evidence. There's no evidence, really, that anyone went out and said, I'm erecting this monument to maintain white supremacy in the South. In fact, no one said that at all. So how do you know that's what they're doing unless you can somehow read their actions or read their mind and saying, well, this is completely it? Uh, Jarvis says that you know James Lowen, who we attacked uh, a week ago, a week or two ago, 
Uh, he calls his history tabloid science. Uh, and this is the issue. I mean, what, what we have here is shock value, people who are writing history. Uh, and it's funny because these people really think they're cutting edge. They're, they're speaking to the man. They're speaking to power. When, in fact, these are the people that are in power. It's this type of material, our material, that's speaking truth to power. It's the currently, as Jar Jarvis said, the currently sanctioned narrative to say that Confederate statues are racist, that sem Southern symbols are racist, that the South is racist, that everything in the South and Southern history is racist. I saw there was, a, there was an article about uh, a copy of the Declaration that had been found behind a wall in Virginia, and it was actually owned by the Madison family. And in the piece, it was in the Washington Post, they said the Madison family occupied their land. Occupied. Now think about that term. They didn't live there. They didn't rear a family there. They didn't uh, farm there. They occupied that land. Now, that's a subtle phrase, but think about what that means. It wasn't actually theirs. They occupied it. It was somebody else's. As we just saw in South Africa, the South African government has confiscated all land from white South Africans. So those people and to the government in South Africa, they were occupying that land. And that is how certain people on the left view Southerners, for example, is how they viewed Southerners in the Reconstruction period. They wanted the land. Get rid of the Southerners, we'll take their land. Southerners were occupiers of northern land. It was theirs. It was their territories, their conquered province. But this isn't a piece that just came out in 2018. Think about that. 2018. It's absolutely crazy the way things are going. But Jarvis points out that this is part and parcel of the modern, this, this idea of the pseudoscience attack. It's, a, it's part and parcel of the modern narrative on Southern history and American history in general. Because not only are Southern monuments under attack, but so is Washington and Jefferson and obviously Madison. Anyone who had owned slaves, anyone who had had any type of position that would be in contrast to what the social justice warriors on the left want has to be forfeit. Now, some Americans have drawn a line at this and said, no, no, no. But see, this is the thing. It's a slippery slope. And it was discussed at our conference. It's a slippery slope. One of the things that Kerry Roberts brought up in his particular talk, which was so good, he talked about how the, the, the Internet and uh, how the tech industry is, is bent on monitoring speech and thought and how you interact with things and clamping down on what they find offensive. Large conglomerates like Google, which owns YouTube, for example, Twitter, Facebook, all of these social media platforms are monitored. And if you say something or do something they don't like, they can just cut you out. And, of course, with so, many, so much of our commerce and industry and ideas and things floating around the Internet now, that can be very dangerous. That's censorship. And, of course, as Kerry called them, this is Revenge of the Nerds, and how these people who didn't like mainstream Southerners because they were athletic or they had positions that uh, they didn't like or whatever the case may be, now they can get back at those people through uh, restrictions on social media. It's, it was a great talk, last talk of the day, fantastic talk. In fact, uh, I think you know it really moved people when it comes to free speech and thought control. This is what we're up against. Uh, and so we need to be aware of that. Of course, the Abbeville Institute is still operating on the Internet. We're still out there. We're still talking about things. And um, we're still trying to be another voice. But who knows what's going to happen as AI takes over and, and things uh, you know, move forward in that regard. And uh, they can already do things where they can make your voice. And uh, there was a discussion about how in the future, not so distant future, within a year or so, less, they could even make a speech. They could, they could, the artificial intelligence could create an entire speech, even uh, with your person, and make it look entirely real and make you say things you never said. That's very dangerous. This is the world we're getting to. So this is a wonderful, wonderful little piece, too. And again, we, we've, we've said this stuff before. Um. Uh, and it's going into, into directions, as, as Jarvis points out. One of the things that I found interesting in this uh, is that there's um, uh, the Buffalo, New York, NAACP wants, uh, wants 
reminders of President Millard Fillmore ended because he signed the Fugitive Slave Act in 1850. So they, they want to get rid of Millard Fillmore. Uh, there's, there's talk about getting rid of Teddy Roosevelt. Yeah, this, is how, this is how far this stuff is going. So where does it stop is the question. Now, how did all this happen? And we've been running a, a, a series of pieces by Dissident Mama, and there was actually a, a, someone who sent a, a comment through the website asking why she uses a pseudonym. Well, because that's what she has to do. Um, so if she didn't want to use her real name, and that's okay. I mean, we, we'll run pseudonyms if, if need be, and this is her own brand. She has her own website, and so uh, that's part of it too. But um, she talks about how the Puritans became this puritanical zeal of New England, and this is not an attack on Puritans. And we've had people get very upset because uh, you did have a, a much more uh, puritanical side of Christianity filter into the South of the Great Awakening. So they think that, we're attacking Puritans. Not necessarily. We're attacking Yankee Puritans and that Puritanical zeal, which became secular ultimately, and then led to progressivism. And I think that she does a very good job here connecting the dots between those things because that is important to understand. This is something Richard Gamble talked about in um, uh, a book about uh, Puritans and this uh, City Upon a Hill. I think that's the title of the book, City Upon a Hill. Uh, but this this connection between that uh, puritanical zeal of New England and then progressivism and that imperialism of America. P- the Puritans were imperialist, culturally imperialist. If you didn't think like them, they were going to force you to think like them. That has a lot to do with American history moving forward and why the South was constantly under pressure uh, to from from New England to change because the Southerners didn't think like them. Southerners didn't act like them. This is something entirely different. To them. So uh, it's important to note that, and important to show where these things, and there's a, there's a third part to this as well, which will run probably not next week, but it'll be the next week. So uh, we'll get the part three. But this connection, connecting the dots between modern progressives and New England Puritans, is an important part of what we do. In fact, we've talked a lot about New England studies here, Northern studies. You know, why is it the Deep South instead of the Deep North? The Deep North was the odd section. The South was like everywhere else uh, in the world, really. But it was the Deep North that was different. And so I think we need to focus a lot of attention on that North. Uh, that's a good area for uh, graduate students as well. You know, people are asking me, what should I, what should I do in graduate school? Focus on the North. Uh, attack the North for what they were. Or focus on 20th century history, Southern history, which is so good. There's a lot of good stuff out there. And talk about... The early 20th century South, that's a key to a lot of things. So there's so many different areas without focusing on the founding generation or the war that need exploration. And if uh, there are any graduate students listening to this, heed my word. Listen to me and say, you know, go do these things because it's uh, if you do northern studies or you do uh, the progressives in the South, uh, you know, they were they were um, interested in things like um, you know, an income tax and anti-banking, you can use that to your advantage because a lot of lefties don't like that stuff either, or at least they like the income tax, but the idea of attacking the rich, I mean, this was a tax on the rich, you can do that. Or you can talk about how this is a tax on big business, and you'll find some common ground with them, and so uh, you'll be able to navigate a little better. Um, and that's that's uh, something that just to, just to uh, think about when you're doing research and thinking about topics. So it's a really great week. Really great conference. In the future, think about going to an Abbeville conference. They are highly worth your time and effort and money uh, to go and be around people that think like you and to have that type of fellowship from people from all over the United States, all over the world. We've had uh, a couple of years ago, we had someone fly in, our, a resident scholar from Japan. Uh, Jack Marcourt flew in from Japan to go to a conference. Now, that's saying something because uh, that's a long trip. <laughs> to come to a conference. So we do get that. And, and uh, so it's wonderful to, uh, to have people come out and, and see what we do and meet you and meet you in person and get to meet us in person. It's, it's a fun time. So uh, think about that. But until next time, good day.